All right, welcome back to Reimagine. Here we are in January of 2021. We made it, guys. We cracked it through into the new year. And uh, what a year we had 2020. There's going to be plenty of chance to look back, but also, uh, as in any January, plenty of chance to look forward. And uh, in doing so, I'm joined by a man with a wonderful vision of what our future may be. Uh, old friend of the show, uh, one of my favorite guests to interview. Of course, I'm talking about Mark Yusko, founder and CEO and Chief Investment Officer of Morgan Creek Capital. Mark, thanks so much for being with us. No, nah, thanks, Asher. Great to be with you in the new year. And uh, I guess since it's, you know, past the 15th, we can't say Happy New Year anymore, but I haven't seen you, so Happy New Year. <laughs> and a Happy New Year to you, Mark. Uh, you know, it, it's an interesting time to, to be talking here now, you know, uh, full sort of uh, clarity on the time we're filming here uh, around the 20th. Uh, an auspicious day uh, in the United States, uh, a changing of the guard, plenty going on. So uh, without further ado, I want to crack a little bit into a little bit of the, the current uh, political, economic, as it were, environment and ask you, Mark, you know, I remember last time uh, we spoke it was before we'd, uh, we'd seen the results of the, of the Georgia uh, Senate runoff. We were talking about food control, what chamber and, and uh, whether or not that might have an impact on things. And you voiced some concerns at the time about having a one party with a sweeping control whichever party that may be, as it turns out, the Democrats. Standing here now, as we stand on Inauguration Day, uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, are you worried? Are you concerned? Are you excited? Uh, fill us in. Yeah, so, uh, you know, worried is probably too strong. You know, look, single party control kind of goes against the whole idea of, of checks and balances. And you, But normally, you would worry... If, if the Democratic side had control, that they would be profligate spenders and, and we'd create these huge deficits and, and there'd be all this, this talk of, of monetary largesse. Well, wait a minute, we already had that, right? We had the greatest <laughs> increase in deficit spending in the history of the Republic under the Republicans. I mean, who would have thunk it? Where'd the Tea Party go? So I think the damage has already been done in the sense of massive deficits, massive monetary, and now fiscal stimulus coming. So what I think is really interesting is, you know, every time something happens in politics, you know, Trump's going to win. Oh my gosh, the world's going to end. The market's going to crash. And then the market rallies. Or Biden's going to win. Oh my gosh, the market's going to crash. And then it rallies. Oh, oh my gosh, the Senate's going to flip. Market's going to crash. And then the market rallies. Why is that happening? Well, it's not the market. The market is not rallying. The value of the dollar is getting obliterated. So the nominal price of assets, whether it be stocks or art or collectible cars or whatever, uh, even crypto, uh, is rising. And so people have this belief that it's a good thing that nominal prices, particularly of stocks, are rising and so they create these narratives about, oh, well, I guess, I guess a Biden and Democratic you know, Senate really is a good thing. Like three months ago, you were saying that was like the devil coming to government because he was going to ban fracking and fossil fuels were going to tank. Best performing stocks this year are the energy stocks. So there's just this wall of money, free money that's been given away and now more is coming uh, ever inching ever cl more closely to UBI, universal basic income. And I just think there's a whole bunch of bad economic advice being bandied about in DC. And I think there's a whole bunch of people who really aren't trained economists, really aren't investors, really are just concerned about staying in power. And they're gonna do or say whatever it takes, including handing out free money to everybody. And I think that's really, really good for a couple things, uh, crypto being one of them, Bitcoin being one of them. Um, but, you know, I'm sure we'll talk more about that. But overall, I like checks and balances. I think, you know, usually these kind of one party systems last about two years because two years in at the midterms, people are fed up with the nonsense. So it'll probably shift back a little bit by then. But uh, look, the, the, the outgoing president did not do a very good job engendering, you know, trust and, and party solidity. Uh, you know, he's leaving with the lowest uh, approval rating in the history of presidents, which is 
really not not unexpected, I guess, but pretty pretty impressive nonetheless. And I think there's a lot of people that that are putting too much hope that things are going to get really really better. Um, so I don't know. It's, it's a long answer to a simple question, but uh, I'm, I'm not concerned or nervous. But I am. I am. I'm not worried, but I am concerned. I am concerned that there's going to be too much of this MMT, too much in the way of deficit spending and not enough uh, kind of, look, my, my basic premise is if creating wealth was as simple as printing money, mm -hmm. wouldn't every country do that? Right. Yeah, and it's an important question and one raised in the context of, you know, let's put these numbers out there. So far, the, the stimulus packages we've seen are, are valued at around $3.9 trillion dollars and already before he's even sat sat in the chair uh you know we've got biden saying he wants to put out another 1.9 trillion dollar stimulus package you know and let's just pause to... there for a second asher mm. like when you say the word trillion <laughs> it's become so commonplace i mean yeah. people don't shudder when they hear that word and and i say this every time i hear that word it's remember a trillion is a dollar every second for 31,710 years. Wow. I mean, it's a ginormous number and it's become, oh, whatever, a trillion here, a trillion there, pretty soon we're talking <laughs> real money. And what people just are, are missing is the total decimation and destruction of fiat currency systems. Look, 34% mm. of all the dollars that exist in history Okay, we're talking more than 200 years of history of the Republic. 34% of them were created in the last year. Right. That's unfathomable. And yet the velocity of money is declining. So we've got this problem that we're just printing monopoly money and we're devaluing it as fast as we can. And that increases the nominal price of stuff owned by rich people. Now, this is the really important point. It increases the value of stuff owned by the 1% or even the 0.1%. It doesn't make the lives of the average person better in any way, shape, or form, right? Even if you get a handout of money, if it costs more to go to McDonald's or the grocery store, you lose. And if you're on a fixed income, where there's no income because interest rates are so low and have to stay low because the deficit's so hard, large, you, you, you lose. So this is a wealth tax. Inflation is a wealth tax. And it's basically kleptocracy, right? It's theft of wealth, what little wealth there is, from the poor to the rich. And I don't understand why people don't get that, but it's happened throughout history. Every right. dictatorship in the world has suffered from this same problem where the poor vote for the dictator, right? It happened in America, right? The poor voted disproportionately for the outgoing dictator wannabe. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's unfathomable that their life is worse off than it was four years ago in every way. And yet they still vote for the guy. Happened in Argentina, happened in Zimbabwe, happened in Venezuela. It, it, I don't understand it, but that's the power of handouts. Certainly, certainly it is the power of handouts and, and, you know, sort of looking into the, I guess, then case for crypto and let's, let's bring this back in for, for what that can do in this market. Obviously, the short to medium term result that we've seen is just an absolute explosion in the market. But, you know, Mark, is, that, is that, this just what we're set to see for the future? Is this just the natural economic response to a supply and demand of, of these dollars just flooding the system? And are we expecting to see this further? You know, make, make the, the bullish or bearish case as you see it. Mark. Now, look, it's, it's, it's math. You know, and I, I have a couple hashtags I tweet out a lot. A lot. Uh, you know, one is hashtag math is hard. Right. And, and math is hard, right? If I ask people, you know, what's two times two? Oh, four. Okay. But if I ask you what's 17 times 23, there's silence, right? Because that's been proven to be the limit of human intelligence. You need a calculator to do 17 times 23. And so when I ask people about, well, how are you at nonlinear logarithmic regression? Well, probably pretty bad. 
But that's the way networks grow. <laughs> networks grow, according to Metcalf's law, along these parabolic regression curves. And people just can't do linear math, let alone parabolic or you know, regression math. And so what, what happens is we see these, these movements, right? These, these network growth. So whether it's Apple as a network or Amazon as a network or, or Bitcoin as a network, and they start very small. You remember it took 15 years for Amazon to really kind of catch on. In the last five years, it's, it's gone totally parabolic if you look at the, the chart. And the same is true of Apple, right? For 20 years, Apple was kind of this novel thing that a few creative types had, but everybody had an IBM computer if you were a real business person. Now I'm talking to you live, you know, on a, on a Mac. And so networks tend to grow in these parabolic moves. And so what we've seen in Bitcoin, uh, in particular over the last, you know, kind of couple months since we were together, is this unbelievable movement and most people look at it and say, well, how is it possible that it could go up, you know, 50% in a month or 100% since Thanksgiving? Well, it's because supply and demand, right? When you have a finite supply of something and you have growing demand, in fact, exponentially growing demand, remember an exponential curve goes like this, it starts to get asymptotic, you, you have a, a, a challenge and the only Thing that can change ultimately is the price of the asset. And so if you think about it, that's true of all scarce assets, right? What's the best performing asset over the last 10 years? Everyone says Bitcoin. No, it's actually not. It's collectible Porsches, right? Because you can't make more old cars. Mm. And most Porsches suffer from what they call the dentist wrap, right? The dentist buys the new Porsche, doesn't know how to drive it, wraps it around a tree. Okay. There's another Porsche gone they can't become a collectible Porsche. And so what happens is when you get down to one or two or three of some vintage of Porsches, Jerry Seinfeld, Jay Leno, and John Shirley, the ex-Microsoft, bid whatever it takes to get it or fine art, right? You make one of something like that, you know, skull, you know, encrusted with blood that needed a whole AC system to, to keep it alive. And Stevie Cohen will pay you whatever. Right, I can't remember that that artist's name, but um, or put the jewels, the diamonds on the skull and sold it for you know tens of millions of dollars because there's only one supply and demand. Or sports franchises, right? There's only so many sports franchises, and the price just gets stupid because there's somebody who always has stupid money, right? Money that just doesn't matter. It's just a number in a in a ledger. So. What we're seeing is true growing demand, right? All the fundamentals for Bitcoin are rising. The number of wallets, the number of uh, transactions, the size of transactions, all of those fundamentals are rising. The supply is actually moderately shrinking, right? Because some gets lost or stolen or, or misplaced. And there, there's only going to be 21 million ever. Now, the one thing that, that I do think needs to happen, I actually changed my, my handle on, on Twitter to this, is... I think we need to shift from talking about Bitcoin as a unit to Satoshis because mm -hmm. there are 2.1 quadrillion, again, big number, big number right. of Satoshis, right? 100 million uh, per uh, Bitcoin. Per Bitcoin, yeah. And so that allows us to have a, a, a more or a less uh, scary number per unit of value. You know, it's kind of like why most people don't own Berkshire Hathaway stock because nobody wants to pay, you know, $220,000 for one share. Well, what difference does it make if it's one share or half a share or a quarter of a share or a tenth of a share? You can buy fractional pieces of Bitcoin. But circling all the way back to your original question, and I'll let you ask you another one, is you ask is, is this Bitcoin going up or is it fiat going down? And I do these things called the 10 surprises. I stole it from Byron Wien. Uh, every year I'm doing it next week. So a year ago, I did one and my bonus surprise, so I do 10 and then I always throw on a bonus 11th. And my 11th surprise last year was that in 2020, Bitcoin could have a big year. Now, I didn't think actually it was going to be 300%, but, but I said it could have a big year. But it wasn't really that Bitcoin was going to do so well as that fiat was going to do poorly. And I showed a picture of a big B Bitcoin sucking on a tube with dollars coming out. 
and and it's that we created so many dollars that we devalued the unit of exchange. And so one of my favorite things, if you look at stock prices over the last three years, they look like they're up about eight, eight and a half percent a year. That's only if you denominate in dollars. If you denominate in gold, stocks are down. You denominate in Bitcoin, stocks are down. So it all depends on the currency you use to value your assets. And when we think about sound money, gold is sound money, Bitcoin is sound money, you get a whole different answer. And, and you know, it, it's so interesting as you, as you put it, you know, with so much flooding into the system and, and I, I really, you know, uh, I'm fascinated by the idea of the, the point you put in about the velocity of the money in the system because we see and you know, the Austrian economists, economists among us love to talk about the cantillion effect and how it's all flooding in at the top but it's never filtering out to the bottom. Yep. So people are missing out. And so, you know, your, your, your average person's missing out. And so I wonder, you know, without getting too deep into the economics, but just sort of thinking about how this is affecting people, you know, when uh, you see calls in the US for, you know, a, a $2,000 check to go straight to every, you know, man, woman and, and child effectively in the, in the, in the country, uh, does that do anything to mitigate this sort of uh, velocity issue or are we just perpetuating nope. a problem and, and putting Bitcoin and other sort of assets back, back uh, it, that increasing value? It, it's a lovely thought that, it might help with the velocity. Uh, the problem is all that money <laughs> is, is what we see. It either pays down debt or buys stocks, right? People have become pajama traders. So what was crazy, the first stimulus check, because they actually track this, right? They actually see your bank account data. Now they don't see your name, but they see the aggregate flow of where that check went in and where it went out. And what they found was about 35, 40% of those first stimulus checks went right out of the bank account to Robinhood or UBS or Merrill Lynch or TD Ameritrade or whatever. And people started buying Tesla stock, right? And, you know, it just, that doesn't change the velocity of money. They're not consuming things. They're not putting that money back to work. And you think about velocity, the way I, I like to describe it, I don't know if you've ever heard the joke about the, the, guy, the guy who comes into a hotel in, in Europe and he says, I wanna, I wanna uh, check out one of your rooms to see if I like it. And the uh, you know, hotel keeper says, fine, you know, leave me a, a hundred pound note uh, as collateral and go to go take a look at the room. And uh, the guy goes upstairs and he takes the hundred pound note and he runs out the back and he pays off his debt to the farmer. And then the farmer runs and pays off his debt to the butcher. And then the butcher runs and pays off his debt at the house of ill repute. And then the woman, the madam comes and pays off her debt to the hoteler and he puts the money back down on the desk. The guy comes downstairs and says, I didn't like any of the room, takes his money back. The entire town's debt has been wiped out and the money never moved, right? And so that, unless you use it, right? Unless I take a dollar and I get a haircut and then that haircutter buys a shirt and then that shirt seller goes to a restaurant, which you can't do because they're all closed. Um, <laughs> but unless you get that movement of money through the economy or you deposit in a bank and the bank lends it out in a fractional reserve basis, right? You put in a dollar, lend out 90 mm -hmm. cents, deposit the 90 cents, lend out 81 cents, put de you know, deposit the 81 cents, lend out 72 cents. Unless you do that over and over, you don't get any increase in velocity or usage of that right. capital. And so all that happens is all that money goes to the rich people and that ends up in the stock market and the value of their assets goes up. And the average person, 49% of the people in America don't own one share of stock, not one. They don't have a 401k, right. they don't have a pension plan, they don't have anything. And so it's a myth that all of these programs are for the average person. It's just a myth, right? Since the inception of the Fed in 1913, the whole game is about putting the money at the top of the pyramid. It's about taking the money from the wealth through this tax, this wealth tax of inflation, and concentrating it at the top. And same thing with handouts, right? If you hand money out, okay, think about the, the stimulus package. You said 1.9 trillion. Well, let's mm -hmm. do the math. $2,000 per household that qualifies. So let's say it's, you know, a hundred million, maybe, okay. maybe, it's probably not even that high. That's way less than 1.9 trillion. Right. Well, where's the rest of the money going? 
same place it always goes pork spending and you know earmarks and you know payola for for favors so it's the system is is broken and uh you know a couple ways we could fix it term limits and others but you know right now this idea that handing people money is going to make the system better it's never worked in history it won't work this time so, so far in our conversation, I feel we've made you know, a pretty compelling uh, bullish case for, for crypto markets, even though it seems to come, unfortunately, at the expense of, of so many in society who, who don't have. But regardless, you know, it seems an overall pretty bullish case. But I want to, again, turning to this, this new administration and, and some of the new regulatory uh, people that are going to come into play. Yeah. We heard just recently uh, from Janet Yellen, uh, you know, the, the nominee uh, for Treasury Secretary, assuming she'll... Uh, She'll get through uh, saying uh, that Bitcoin and its ilk, uh, as you know, the old refrain goes, you know, used for money laundering, used for illicit purposes, and they need regulatory crackdowns. We heard similar things from uh, Christian Lagarde uh, from the ECB, uh, you know, what was that, a couple of weeks ago. These sort of refrains are becoming very popular at the moment. And as cryptocurrencies really start to break through into the mainstream salience, are we about to start to see a, a real crackdown? And, and what does that mean in your opinion? Well, you're going to hear a lot of rhetoric, but they can't crack down, right? <laughs> the funny thing about this is, you know, I have a, again, a hashtag for, I have a hashtag for everything, but I have a hashtag for this, ignore the FUD, right? So ignore the fear, uncertainty, and doubt that, look, you can rely on a couple things, right? Death and taxes. And one thing that you can rely on for certain is that if somebody's livelihood depends on them resisting something, they will. And right. so if you think about financial institutions, which are about to be disrupted and disintermediated by crypto, particularly Bitcoin, which basically you can unbank yourself and, and remove the need for that trusted third party. So of course, people who are paid by financial services firms, like Jamie Dimon, right? Okay, CEO of JP Morgan, it's a fraud, his own firm, his own firm, right, that he's the president of, just issued a report calling for $146,000 price this year, or maybe it was next year, but it's, it's comical, right? So Lagarde, right, saying, oh, it's used by money launderers. Really? Are you kidding me? Given the choice between a sack of money, right, counterfeit $100 bills or real $100 bills, whichever one, and fingers on a keyboard, if you're a bad guy, which one are you using? I'm using the sack of money. In fact, um, uh, oh, what's her name? Han, uh, I can't remember her first name. Um, she's a partner at Andreessen Horowitz. Um, says it, look, says I was a prosecutor for 20 years. And given that choice, fingers on a keyboard or sack of money, give me fingers on a keyboard. I can catch those guys. So yeah. this idea, this this ridiculous statement that, you know, it's used for illicit purposes. Sure. Did some people in the early days on Silk Road, when it existed, exchange Bitcoin for drugs? Yes. Every single day, do people exchange cash for drugs? Yes. Are they going to stop? No. So having an electronic currency or a digital currency People are going to use those things to do the things they want to do. Are people using cash or credit cards even, credit cards, which is how they got busted, right? When they went to the houses of ill repute, back to my joke. So people are going to do stuff and they're going to use the currency in which they reside. And the idea that Bitcoin is facilitating it is just silly. Now, why does Christine Lagarde or you know, Janet Yellen uh, not want us to, to have a, a opt-out currency. Exactly for what I just said, right? They don't want us to opt out of the system. They want to keep the system the way it is, which makes them, the rich people, rich and keeps the poor poor. And what happens if somebody takes their fiat and converts it into Bitcoin, it is now a superior store of value I now can't be devalued. Think about a Venezuelan, right? Maduro comes in, gets all his cronies, siphons all the capital at the top, and then he devalues the Bolivar and everybody's wiped out. 
unless you converted your bolivars to Bitcoin or Dash or something else, then you're not screwed. Pardon my French. Although I said that once with a Frenchman and he said, why do you say that? We're not vulgar. <laughs> and someday I'm actually going to, I'm going to look up why we say pardon my French. Um, but here's the thing, this idea that uh, people whose livelihood depends on the continuance of the existing corrupt system to embrace Bitcoin and its brethren and sistren, it's just not going to happen. And so they're going to fight it. And it's, it's the old Mandela quote, you know, first they laugh at you, then they fight you, then, they, oh no, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. And yeah, they're, they're going to try to fight, but they're going to lose. And but, losing doesn't mean the dissolution of the entire system. It just mm -hmm. means there's a better way to take a portion of your wealth and move it outside this system that is imploding on itself as it devalues because people at the top, government, will always do whatever it takes to stay in power. And if you look over the course of history, every powerful empire in history has fallen. Every single one. There are no long duration empires. They just don't exist because people get greedy. So, I mean, you know, obviously, uh, you know, I take your points and, and I, I, you know, I'll, I'll by and large agree that, you know, that well, there's no one, no one is going to go be out there, you know, killing uh, Bitcoin uh, at its root, you know, ripping it out root and stem. But I suppose I wonder, you know, like thinking about like the, the sort of the current day trader or the speculator in the space who's now looking at that. And, you know, as you say, it comes, it comes across as FUD and it's perceived as, as uh, you know, just trying to sow that uncertainty in the industry. But with the current wave seemingly being driven by institutional demand, you know, these institutions are coming on board and that's what everyone's saying. Finally, they're coming and they're doing it. Is this not going to keep a whole lot of those big institutional players out? You know, if you're running a pension fund and you hear Yellen or Lagarde say this, are you not going to go, ah, you know what? Let's wait a few more years till they've sorted this out and then maybe we'll, we'll decide whether to go in. Is that, I mean, what is the implications of that? Uh, you're, you're absolutely right, Asher. Look, fortune favors the bold. You know, people like Michael Saylor uh, yeah. and others, right? I mean, of course, it's easy to say, I'll wait. It was easy 10 years ago to say, I'll wait, right? This is just a little project for cryptography students and, and drug dealers. It was easy five years ago to say, I'll wait. And it was just a little playground for, for speculators and, and a few techies. It's easy today to say, I'll wait because yeah, Michael Saylor and one or two others are, are, are realizing that cash truly is trash and that, you know, Ray Dalio was right for the wrong reason uh, at WEF a couple of years ago when he said cash is trash. It's not that cash isn't a great asset. It is better than stocks when stocks fall, but it is trash when you think about the uh, perpetual devaluation of it by the creation of more. And in a COVID year like last year, um, that just got exacerbated, as I said, you know, 34% of all the, the dollars created. So we're at this interesting juncture <clears throat> where, and look, it's my pinned tweet on Twitter, right? The greatest wealth is created by investing in something that you believe in before others even understand it. And you will be mocked, you will be ridiculed, but it's worth it. <laughs> and, and the same thing is true here is all the people who were early were mocked, ridiculed, said they were stupid, said they were foolish, accused of being criminal, accused of perpetuating, you know, drug trafficking or human trafficking. You know, Bill Gates said all kinds of stuff. I mean, it's all just silly. But ultimately, disruption happens. You know, one of my favorite stories is I ask people all the time, do you know why Stoops in downtown New York, down, down near mm -hmm. Wall Street, are nine feet above street level. The stoop of the house, right, where you walk in the door is nine okay, feet yeah. above street level. And people said, no, I have no idea. I'm like, horse shit. I'm like, what, what do you mean? <laughs> like, literally, horse poop 
right, would stack up and the street sweepers would push it to the side and it would stack up three, four, five feet high. And the ladies didn't want their dresses getting all, you know, covered in horse poop. So they built the sidewalks nine feet, which was really a problem if you got drunk at night and fell off the sidewalk. But they, <laughs> they figured out that, you know, they could get around the horse poop. Well, so then what happened is the horseless carriage came along. And what happened? The street sweepers passed out pamphlets saying that if you got in a horseless carriage, you'd die. What? It, it's, it's like when the airplane came out, they had the people who were in the train industry handing out pamphlets saying that your body would crush in on itself if you went past a certain miles per hour. Clearly silly, but they wanted to spread that FUD, that fear, uncertainty, and doubt so they could keep their jobs and they could keep their little cabal intact. And that's what governments do. That's what corporations do. But at the end, do we have cars? Yep. Do we have airplanes? Yep. Are we going to have digital national currencies? Yep. Are we going to have a digital alternative currency like Bitcoin, global currency? Yep. It's not going away. Disruption sure. happens and you can't put the genie back in the bottle once it's out. Uh, it is. It's a powerful, you know, uh, you know, direction and force for the industry. And we, as we see it grow, we see new players come come on board. And I suppose I, I want to ask you because there's, there's a trend I've been noticing. Speaking to a lot of people throughout this conference, uh, you know, as we saw after 2017 or in and around 2017, we saw the the new wave of at that point it was speculators coming on board. Yep. Now this time people have said that this wave and this hype cycle is, is the institutional wave, and we're seeing these these early institutions or, or middle middle institutions start to come on board. But with that has come a sense of professionalization, professionalism, and whether we've achieved it or not is another debate. But you know, there's a, a goal towards this professionalization, potentially at the expense of we could say the little guy. Now I'll be interested to see what your views are on this. But you know, whether I'm talking to to mining operations that are saying that, that the whole mining rig is dead to, uh, you know, the sort of uh, the sort of investor analyst that's, you know, sitting in his basement and now it's all being, you know, swiped in by a big professional grade uh, yeah. data aggregation and news aggregation, whatever, any level of the crypto space is going to hit with this professionalization wave. Firstly, I'd just like to get your views on, is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? And, and do we risk losing some of the, the positive characteristics of the space? by heading down this trend? Man, such, such a great insight and such an important question. Um, look, professionalization of every innovation is important, right? I, I, I say that one of the things I, my, I made a habit in my career of hanging out with the bad guys. And people say, what are you talking about? I'm like, think about it. All technology begins at the fringe. And the time to invest in technology is when the bad guys are using it. So who are the first people to have a pager? Drug dealers. Who are the first people to widely adopt the internet? Porn. So why is it different anytime that there's a new innovation, right? What about, you know, liquor, right? Prohibition, drug, you know, uh, what about drugs? And, you know, what about the development of, of now psychedelics, right? It, it starts with the bad guys, eventually becomes professionalized and integrated into society, and then it becomes useful. You know, the internet today, pretty useful thing, but there were people in the 90s that were like, no, this is bad, this is evil, it's, it's used for illicit purposes. No, it's a, it's a phase shift. It's a technological evolution that again is inevitable and this professionalism does happen. And yeah, think about the early days of the internet. There were all these little mom and pop internet service providers, ISPs. And then AOL came along and they were wiped out. And then the browser came along and then it became consolidated into you know, the big tech. And yeah, once the professionalization occurs to the extent of oligopoly or monopoly, yeah, that's bad, but we're so far from that. Yeah. And yeah, is it, is it glam, not glamorous, is it romantic 
to think that Bitcoin would stay the realm of the anarchist, uh, you know, libertarian, Austrian economist, you know, rogues outside the, the you know, the realm of, of the fiat fiasco. Yeah, that's great. But I always talk to tell the story about, look, we can trace all this back, uh, not to Satoshi, even further back um, to Tim May, right? God rest his soul. Tim May wrote the, the Crypto Anarchist Manifesto in 1988. And he predicted everything that would happen, including what Satoshi would create eventually, whoever he, she, they are, the problem is, problem is, no one read it because he was an anarchist. And when you're an anarchist, you don't have any friends and you sit up by yourself <laughs> in your fortress in the woods with all your guns and people are afraid of you. So it took 20 years for people to say, oh, okay, there's something there. There's some there there. And then let's professionalize it a little bit and let's maybe not be anarchist, let's be libertarians. Still pretty scary, mm -hmm. but let's get a few more people into the mix. And then it was like, oh, well, now the bad guys will adopt it. Well, if the bad guys are using it, well, then maybe we could use it. So let's try us using it. And now you got the little guy or gal, and yeah, are the days gone where you could plug in your laptop in your dorm room and steal electricity from, I don't mean steal, borrow electricity <laughs> from the university and, and, and make some people. Of course. Now the problem is most of those kids forgot their password or they threw away their laptop. Right. And, you know, there's a true story. One of my, my uh, former partners, his son had tens of thousands of Bitcoin <laughs> on a laptop, hard drive crashed. They sent it to NSA, nothing. Oh. And, you know, it's a bummer. Um, but stuff <laughs> like that happens because in those early days, it's not professional. Your word is so good, professional. So we're professionalizing the whole industry, the whole asset class, and it's going to develop. Think about the user experience of buying a Bitcoin. You used to have to meet in a dark, shady alley with the bad guy, and there was risk, right? You could get robbed or, or killed or, or you know, bad things could happen. Today, I can go to Coinbase or, you know, or, or Gemini, and, and with a couple clicks, I've got Bitcoin. And I can send it anywhere in the world instantaneously. I can send it to you right this second from my phone. So I always tell you, look, gold, right? Gold's been around for 5,000 years. It's awesome. The problem is all the gold in the world fits in two Olympic-sized swimming pools. It's really, that's a, that's a big amount. All the Bitcoin in the world fits right here. Now, I don't have all the Bitcoin in the world, so don't <laughs> sim swap me. But I don't keep any on my phone. But... I could carry all of it right here and I can transport it across borders and, and it's infinitely divisible down to you know eight decimal points. Whereas gold is not very divisible, right? It's not very, you know, if you have a bar, I can't break it in half and give you half, I can't do that. So there are just so many things that are good and positive about technological evolution. And that adoption, that professionalization, that institutionalization has occurred with every technological innovation in history. It's happening right now before our eyes. And yes, it is nostalgic to think of the pajama trader, you know, speculating in Bitcoin and now he can't compete or she can't compete with Susquehanna. Yep, same is true in stocks, same is true in bonds, same is true in, in Bitcoin as it becomes a mainstream asset. And that's a good thing. Uh, you know, I, I take your, your, your point absolutely, you know, about the positivity and about, you know, you can't be a rebel forever. If you're a rebel and you win, eventually at some point you, you've got to be accepted, but, you know, you've got to accept you're part of the mainstream. But I, I guess, you know, we, we focus a lot, you know, in our conversations, we talk about Bitcoin and the development of Bitcoin, but let's, let's put Bitcoin aside for a moment. Yeah. And maybe even let's put, let's even put Ethereum aside for a moment. Yeah. Let's talk about the, the rest of the market that exists out yes. there because, you know, I think there are a lot of people out there, particularly new users coming into the space now who are sort of thinking, crap, I've missed the boat on Bitcoin. Maybe I've missed the boat on Ethereum, but man, there are so many other coins out there that are ripe for this, this you know, this chance to, you know, up yep. my wealth tenfold, a hundredfold, yep. whatever it yep. may be. I mean, is that market in your eyes, looking at where we stand in 2021, you know, and this question gets asked a lot, but I think it's very relevant now as institutions come on board, 
Like they're not buying these smaller alts, are they? I mean, are, are these coming along for the ride? Are they are they bringing along the picture, or is this a two horse race? Maybe a three or four. Not horse? yet. Look, think think about anything, right? Um, think about micro cap stocks, mm -hmm. right? If you're a small institution with a hundred million dollars, you could buy micro cap stocks. If you are, you know, state of California with two hundred and fifty billion dollars. You can't buy micro cap stocks. You can you can't even buy small cap stocks or mid cap stocks. You got to buy mega cap stocks, and you got to do mega deals in in the buyout world. You can't do venture capital. It just won't move the needle. So yeah, it's absolutely true that there's a whole world of altcoins. And here's the thing: utility tokens are basically crowdsourced venture capital, pre-seed stage venture capital. The problem with pre-seed stage venture capital, it's got like a 98, 99% loss ratio. Most will go to zero, literally go to zero. And that's not a bad thing, right? Ideas don't all work. And backing an idea, if you have technological expertise and you can evaluate the use cases for some particular utility token, and you can uh, spread your bets across many of them, great. But don't speculate on a single idea or a single token because it has a non-zero probability, actually a pretty high probability of going to zero. Now, once things become adopted, right? Once things become you know, integrated into some system, whether I, I talk about protocol stack, right? You said we have Bitcoin at the base layer. We got Ethereum, which is kind of like the www dot. It's a tool to build applications on top of, of the protocol stack. And, and maybe we got file transfer protocol, which is like FTP and the internet. And uh, maybe we've got, I mean, Filecoin, which is like file transfer protocol, Filecoin. Right. Uh, maybe we got Polkadot and Cosmos. You know, I, I'm not sure because in the internet, we right. got TCP IP, we got HTTP, we got SMTP, we got www. And we got FTP. Five protocols used to be 80. And those five, then we build applications on top. And I think the same thing's true here in that there will be some of those projects where you do make 10 times your money, 100 times your money. Great. But it takes technological expertise and understanding to really win there. Like if you're just punting around, you know, fine, right? If you want to trade momentum and you're okay with on occasion going to zero, good for you. Um, but ultimately institutions aren't going to play in that space because they, they can't put enough capital in. Now, as things become more mainstream, right? DeFi is a great example. DeFi, which there are a lot of people that want to hate on it, and say, oh, it's it's just a scam, or there's gonna be all these rug pulls. Look, decentralized finance taking the place of traditional finance and letting code and software and smart contracts do the work of human beings. I mean, I'm invested in in this one protocol bond. Look, if if they get the protocol right, which they haven't done yet, but if they get the protocol right, it could. I'm not saying it will, but it could replace JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, structured finance groups. Right. Because I would trust software more than I would trust <laughs> some of the bad guys inside those big organizations. Think about all the fines they've paid recently from price manipulation and spoofing and, and all the other bad things. And when they when people ask them about it, why did you do this? Like, oh, it's just you know, whatever. And the fine is just a cost of doing business, but we're going to keep doing it. We're going to manipulate the price of gold because it's very profitable for us. But a contract, right? A smart contract would take away that graft and that corruption, and it would scale it to more people around the world. And so DeFi could become institutional. It won't right now because the protocol's market caps aren't big enough. But once they become big enough and once they become accepted, will other people buy Aave or Synthetics or Compound? Yeah, probably. No, I mean, not probably, definitely. And so all of the things that are happening as we go from a single idea, right? A technological evolution that is cryptographically secure, 
exchange of value or money over internet protocol. As we expand that to value over internet protocol, you know, VoIP used to be voice over internet protocol. That's, mm -hmm. that's yesterday's news. Value yeah. over internet protocol might be the greatest innovation of this century. Big statement, I know, right. but it's possible. And when all value can exchange across borders 24 seven, who now we're talking. And so yes, long-term the institutions will be there right now, a couple, are dabbling, right? We're dabbling um, and you know, some others are dabbling, but we need critical mass. And every market, to your point earlier, every market starts with the little guys or gals and they build the market onto which the big money can eventually participate. And you think about, you know, starting Uber, did, Texas teachers put first money into Uber? No, and not because they're not good investors. They are really good right. investors, but they couldn't write a million dollar check or what, maybe it was even smaller. Maybe it was a hundred thousand dollar check the first money into Uber when it was just an idea and a crazy idea at the time, people thought actually a really good idea, cool idea. Um, and then Lyft, right? We were early investors in Lyft. Why do we do that? Because they had better tech. They had a better algorithm for ride sharing, not necessarily for ride hailing, but for mm -hmm. ride sharing, their algorithm was better. And so we invested. Now, did bigger investors than us come in later, in later rounds, pre-IPO or IPO? Of course, that's the way it works. And that's why I talk about all of crypto today is still venture capital investing. Bitcoin, it's like a series C or a series D. A lot of these altcoins that may become something are not even series A, right? They're pre-seed and seed. And then some of the DeFi projects are about to become series A. Well, series A is very risky, but it's also very lucrative. Right. Certainly plenty of profit to be made uh, in those right projects. Although, as you say, that risk threshold, that risk threshold rather, really has to be there. People have to be really aware. So then I guess, you know, going from the from the broad scale speculative, let's close in the time scale of what we're looking at here a little bit. You know, at this point in 2021, you know, we've seen so many fascinating trends occur over the last year. You know, as you said, the, you mentioned the pajama traders, obviously the, the coronavirus impacts that have had on the whole manner of our working lives. You know, people have called this 2020, the true start of uh, the digital revolution of our lives. You know, the, the, this is the true internet era began as of today. We'll, we'll see how that pans out uh, you know, in the long term. But 2021, we've got a, a vaccine on the horizon coming out you know, in various ways. People are looking at the light at the end of the tunnel beyond uh, the sort of corona era, if we can call it an era. Uh, what are you particularly looking forward to? What trends are you watching? And what do you think is, is the most important thing that people can, can look at right at this juncture? Yeah, I, I, again, I think you, you set the stage incredibly well in that what happened in 2020 really is, is a wrecking ball. I had this great cartoon that I found and it's, it's this team sitting in the top you know, floor of a, of a high rise building and it's the CEO around the board table with his board. And he's saying, you know, I, I think digital disruption is years away. We don't have to change anything at all. And right outside the windows, there's a giant wrecking ball saying COVID-19. And, and basically what COVID-19 did is, is it accelerated to your point, all of this move to digital into the digital age. And whether it's digital work or digital learning or digital commerce, ultimately the digital brain, uh, all the things that, that are, are coming have, have absolutely been accelerated. We pulled forward demand that was gonna take years to, to kind of figure out. And that comfort level, um, you know, you had time sitting in your home, you know, in lockdown, to explore and to try out different ways to buy a crypto here or change, you know, exchange a crypto there or, or see how e-commerce really works and realize that, oh, okay, that works for me. And if it doesn't fit, I send it back and it's not that bad. And so all of these, these trends accelerate. And, and that's been true for every innovative innovation in history, right? There are these inflection points and those inflection points can be 
uh, a realization of, of a new technology. It could be uh, a narrative shift or it could be an external exogenous shock. You know, think about the Manhattan Project and what that did for things like nuclear power and, and ultimately, right, it, it ended the war, but then it led to the you know, creation of incredible technological innovation because you brought the smartest scientists together and, and put them in a room and said, can't leave until you figure this out. And so uh, if we did that more often, it would be good actually. In fact, you know, if we're up to me, instead of having social security be a, a, a Ponzi scheme where you know, I pay in and my parents take it out, I would actually create a giant venture capital fund, the same way that the government of Singapore did or Tomasic, and I'd actually invest that money in innovation. So I would take this huge capital base that's basically infinite because there are going to be people collecting Social Security forever, and I would actually invest the capital instead of having it be a pay-as-you-go Ponzi. Um, but no one seems to like that idea, but, but I think it's a really good <laughs> idea. And I would even volunteer to run the fund. But um, I mean... Again, government of Singapore is is the the picture. I mean, they invest in all of these great technologies, and so they are way overfunded instead of underfunded, and then they don't have to deficit spend and destroy their currency, which is why the Sing dollar is actually really good. So, if we just think for a minute about where we are, uh, I like to say this is is twenty wonderful, um, or twenty twenty wonderful, and this could be just a wonderful year as we emerge right, from lockdown and we realize that, look, we've been dealing with viruses for thousands of years. This one's no different than any other virus we've ever dealt with. So let's move on. But then let's embrace that, that, that catalyst that occurred in the digitization of all things and moving to this digital life. And I actually disagree with those that think 2020 was the year. I think it's 2024. If you go back in, in my historical timeline, 54 was the mainframe, 68 was the microchip, 82 was the personal computer, 96 was the internet, 2010 was the mobile net, and 2024 is the trust net or the internet of value. So we're still four, three years away from that. And that's when the aha moment where everybody sees it and everybody's all in, and then the innovation, because the S curve starts off slowly, but then hits the inflection point and accelerates. So this catalyst maybe pulled that forward a little bit. And so maybe it won't be the traditional 14 year cycle that it's always been. I still think it will. Um, but the opportunities today to embrace change, to invest for change, and to think of innovation as an asset class and innovation in crypto in particular isn't just financial services. Financial services is a big, huge opportunity, $7 trillion, there's that T word again, of wasted expenses. And you know we got seven different legacy systems to settle a, a bank loan, it takes 30 days. It's ridiculous, it's just settled instantaneously, right? I shouldn't have to wait 30 days to get approval for a mortgage. Our company figure or company we invested in figure can do it in five minutes, get your money in five days uh, through AI and, and crypto. So all this innovation is coming and there's no way to stop it. And those that want to try to stop it are just placating the, the, the masses to try to buy votes so they can stay in power. They know they can't stop it. They know they're powerless against innovation because innovation is what drives all wealth creation. It's what's always driven wealth creation. It's what we celebrate and reward when we don't demonize it, um, which is just the politicians trying to demonize it to, to you know, make it uh, less easy for them to, to continue to make our lives better. Um, because look, ultimately, technology will evolve and crypto and bitcoin and and you know altcoins and defi all these things are just applications of technological innovation in our lives and we think about things where there's inefficiencies and inequities and the thing i love about about this is it will decrease income and wealth inequality it will increase access. 
it will make education better, right? Our education system is still designed from the industrial period where the goal was to make people who would follow directions and work in factories. We don't do that anymore. Now it's all about creativity and innovation. So what we should be teaching our kids is not how to sit on a square and pay attention and regurgitate. We should teach them how to think creatively and think outside the box and challenge authority and challenge big idea or, or create big ideas. And that's what this evolution, ultimately revolution is all about. And it's powered by the innovators that are coming into this space. And I would say, follow the talent. In my lifetime, I've seen two waves of talent that changed the world. The first was in the 90s, early 90s, as people were leaving real jobs to come into internet, when people mm -hmm. didn't even know what the internet was. And you were chastised and mocked and ridiculed. And today it's the same thing. I gave a keynote address at a crypto conference back before the lockdown started a little over a year ago. And a guy came up to me after and says, will you call my mom? <laughs> what? <laughs> he says, I'm a lawyer and I left a big law firm. I'm working for you know, a crypto company and my mom thinks I'm, I'm an idiot. And what you just said is exactly why I did it. You know, would you call my mom? I'm like, sure, call your mom. And uh, I'll tell her that, no, you're a pioneer and you're smart because you are taking advantage of this inevitable wave and you're taking your skills and talents and ability to untether yourself, unleash yourself from the past and focus on the forward. Um, so that was cool. Uh, certainly, uh, such a vision, a powerful vision you put out there. You know, it, it kind of—I can't help but think when you spoke about everyone being being put in the room together and, and having to sort of start thinking and bubbling those ideas as these sort of digital monks, you know, brewing their early beers, figuring out the early, you know, codes to evolution and whatnot. But uh, in the digital realm, in the digital space, Mark, you know, I always love talking to you. There's always such vision there, such a look at the future. You leave me with a warmth in my heart, but. Uh, you know, we'll wrap, we'll wrap for now. And I want to thank you again for joining us for this edition of Reimagine. There's always so much to talk about in every single conversation we have and every single conversation you've had with us. It just shows how much has changed over just this short space of time and how much is left to change. So, you know, Mark, again, thank you so much for being with us. No, thanks for having me, Asher. And, and just everyone needs to remember that, you know, change is easy to fear, right? Change is hard. Change is scary but change is inevitable and change is good. And, and change leads to innovation, which leads to wealth creation, which leads to uh, a better world. And you know, fighting against it and railing against it is, is you know, tilting against windmills. So, so let's, let's be the anti Quixotes and uh, you know, let's focus on embracing change and embracing the future and uh, you know, great to be with you and we'll look forward to doing it again. Certainly powerful words and for everyone watching, uh, stay with us. There's plenty more excellent content still to come.